Hey everybody, it is, look at that, we made it in. We were getting close, we were like, oh no, it's two, we gotta get on. Um, hi, I'm Rachel. No, I'm Meg. Uh, you probably know us by now, but in case you don't. Um, also, we, so one of the first things we wanna do is welcome uh, our new Chief Revenue Officer, Bob Turnus, um, who might be joining us live, or um, just gonna follow up on the recording, but he'll, you'll be seeing him in and around um, the Facebook group once in a while. Bob uh, is joining us. He's got uh, about 20 years of sales experience, uh, primarily in IT and uh, IT solutions, and then kind of leadership and training around implementation of IT solutions. He's an agile guy. I don't mean to say agile like he's flexible. I mean, he's into agile, like he knows things about that. That's where his uh, experience has been. Um, he lives in Boulder, Colorado and uh he's an avid rock climber and skier skier and by road biking he, he's working out like crazy right now he's at crossfit or was heading to crossfit or something hey mark yeah. um and he has a, a beautiful wife who's an artist painter and two adorable girls so all true all true all right all right let me want to do the announcements yes announcements um, IX Leadership Live and in person with yours truly, Meg Mankey, uh, will be held in Rapid City at University Center, Black Hills uh, State University campus, January 21 and 22. Uh, right now, there's an early bird special, so you save $100 if you sign up before January 12th. Um, and so um, that, tell them what that is a little bit, because they might not really know what that means. Yeah, so um, it is our certification uh, live instead of online. So for two days, we will learn all about culture types, uh, Kurtz change transition model, um, leadership, accountability, values, vision, building teams, having a strategy, um, and how to implement all of our intellectual property around uh, leadership. Uh, everyone who participates gets a free copy of the book. Um, if you already have one, then you have one to give away. And um, also, whoever participates gets a year free in our closed Facebook group. Um, so that's another important thing you should know about. And basically, you walk away with all the knowledge you need to be certified in IX leadership, meaning you can go then. Uh, we'll give you all the tools and resources you need to culture type um, group other groups of people uh, on a consulting basis or within your own organization. Um, and you can train on all of the concepts, culture types, uh, Kurtz change transition model, Mad Hatter principle, experience cube, all the stuff. You will have access to all of it, um, and then you can train on it. Um, it's a steal of a deal. It is a steal of a deal. It's uh, eight. It's nine ninety seven. Nine ninety seven. Eight yeah. ninety seven. If you uh, buy Early before birds. January twelfth. If you want to know about it, uh, let us know <clears throat> either in here, or you can message us, or on the group. Or you can send me an email, send Rachel an email, LinkedIn message, however you want. Just let us know you're interested in the live class in Rapid in January. And I will, whomever, will send you um, a link to get registered. Actually, we'll put the link in the Facebook. Yeah, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll put the, the link, link in here. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Um, the other thing that we really need, really need, uh, is Amazon reviews. And we know that... Uh, I, oh, over a thousand people have gotten the book, but we still only have six reviews. So we know it takes a minute. I know um, if now Mark's on, and I know he's ordered books. The trick is, is that if you've gotten a book from us and didn't get it on Amazon, then sometimes they make make you feel a little like, to, should I actually put a review on? But if you have the book, um, put a review out there for us. Um, so what we've decided to do is that if you put a review out for us, um, yeah, Mark, get it out there. Uh, if you give us a review and you're already in the group, then there's two things you can have. You can have one free invitation to a colleague, friend, 
whatever to be in this group and that's a eight dollar seven ninety nine a month value so that's for a year so that's a, essentially a hundred dollar gift for one of your colleagues friends or mm, someone you know um, or we could will be happy to send a book to somebody on your behalf um, that's a sixteen dollar value so if you post a review you get something from us for free because we really that would really help we have um, that's the one differentiator. We're driving a lot of business to the Amazon site. We have a lot, a lot of interest. And one of the, the last things we need in place is reviews, but we can't do that ourselves. We need your help to do that. So thank you so much um, for doing that for us. Okay, there's something black on the screen. So before we get started, that has to get off my Did you get it? head. Okay. okay. And well, you know, they can't see it. Uh, no, I know that. Screen. No, I know that. I okay. could see it on my forehead. It was really bugging okay. me. Okay. All right. Yep. Thank, thanks. I'm, I'm fine now. You're good. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. You All right. Get started? Um, we are going to talk today about culture types in the workplace. The uh, number one question of the day, uh, of the week, was, uh, hi, Laura. <laughs> Uh, what if what what culture type is my boss or when once I figure that out what does that really mean <clears throat> and how I communicate with that person no. so we're going to today walk through the four different culture types in the workplace and what do they look like and what does that mean and how do we interact with those people uh, in a healthy manner so that they understand uh, what we're saying and uh, how how do you also get them to engage with you in a way that makes sense for you Mm -hmm. And instead of normally what we do is we start with a topic and then we move into the question, but we felt like this gave us enough, the question gave us enough framework around to talk about sort of the broader story. So we're going to kind of walk through both. And, and frankly, the lessons we can learn uh, working for a boss and with a certain culture type is also we can garner some lessons from other people in our team, those that we lead or work with all the time. The power dimension is different, certainly, the authority, the authority. But um, but I think we'll 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 try to sneak some of those in too as we go. All right. Uh, well, we'll start in the uh, top left corner with the fixer. I was just thinking. I don't my uh, my purse book's inside. Do you have your a book out here? Yeah. Okay. She's gonna get her book. Do we need one? Or we need well, I was. I, well, I know we wrote it. We don't need it. Oh, but in case these guys want to see the thing. So our purse books. We call them our purse books because we carry them in our purse. Um, that actually saved us when we were in um, when we were in New York City because our books didn't arrive. They're guaranteed until they're not. Uh, so anyway, so we actually put our purse books out on the table, and our awesome PR team had a couple books that they happened to have with them, and we used those as display models. So this has traveled widely already. So just as a reminder, I'll just flash up our four. Let me see if I can do it four types. That's on page, for those of you who have a book or following along, page 26. So um, fixers, independent, stabilizers, and organizers. So, where, sorry, where did you want to start? Uh, I'm going to start with fixers. Yeah, this one's easy to describe because it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Although we'll see how insightful you are about how other people should deal with you. Oh, I know how they should. Um, okay, so a fixer is someone who is very chaos tolerant, prefers freedom in their workplace, uh, don't like to be necessarily tied to a desk. They're uh, really more interested in working in a team and collaborating. Um, if they need to go sit at their desk, of course they can. If they need to be orderly, of course they can. They just really don't like it. Uh, and. Um, I thought for a really long time. So my my mother is also a fixer. Who we love dearly. Love dearly. Yeah. Um, and she is not, um, she's not disorderly, but she doesn't have, she didn't have a great concern for uh, time when I was growing up. And it really drove me nuts because I had a lot of places I was supposed to be on time, like to the bus to get to school <laughs> or to the bus to get to a volleyball game or, uh, you know, to a concert that I was supposed to be playing in or you know, whatever the, whatever the event was. And man, it just really drove me nuts. Uh, 
until I started to realize that there are other people around me that are way more orderly and timely and uh, organized than I am. And so then when we developed all this framework, uh, I realized, well, I'm a fixer. So I just, it's not that I don't care about other people's timelines, uh, deadlines. I just don't think about the world that way. Uh, it's not important for me to be, you know, five minutes early to be on time. So that is something as a fixer that I have to work really hard on to make sure that I'm respecting other people's timelines. So I had an employee that worked for me uh, and she is probably an organizer or maybe an independent, but like just right above the line. She's probably dips, might dip down into organizer, dip up into independent. So anyway, she really was all about the details and the order and when are we going to do it and how are we going to do it and what do you want me to have, what, what do you want me to have done by when? So I had to uh, really think hard about how to communicate with her because I didn't want to do her a disservice and just say, oh, whenever that did not, she, that was not okay with her. Um, and then she also learned a little bit to work with me because she would say, listen, I know that we probably have a deadline for this. Why don't you tell me what it is? I'll tell you one, what we should get done between now and then and, and, and when we should get it done. And then we'll work on it together. So she sort of honored my need to teamwork the idea together. Uh, and then I honored her need for the deadline and, and meeting all of the specific guidelines and orderliness that uh, she required. So what else should we add to Fixer? Working for, for a Fixer. For, yeah. What does that mean to work for a Fixer? Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah. Well, I guess my perspective was, well, what if you're a stabilizer working for a Fixer? What, what will probably be your, um, you know, the conflict if there is one? Or the disconnect? I think the challenge. Uh, so of uh, the opportunity. Yeah. Look at you using fancy HR word. I know, I'm working hard at it. Uh, we never say the word weakness. I you know, know, I just want to say, even though I'm an HR person, it's really our fault that there's like white ribbon, white participation ribbon society now. <laughs> everybody, everybody deserves the chance altogether now. It's totally your fault. It's not my fault. That's not how I ever managed, but um, I know it. No, yeah, it is a little bit. Uh, okay, so if I'm a stabilizer and I'm working for a fixer, yeah. So we both really like team environment and collaborating together. However, when a fixer sits down at the table, sits down, whatever, they're walking around the room pacing, thinking of ideas, and they got sticky notes in their hand and they're writing stuff on the whiteboard. Uh, so when the fixer is pacing around the conference room and the stabilizer's calmly sitting at the desk taking notes because they know stabilizers prefer that order. They like to know they have the agenda in front of them. Yes, and they like to know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and to whom is it going to happen and who is going to make sure it gets done. So I think the real challenge for a stabilizer working for a fixer is that you probably don't feel like you're getting uh, enough detail uh, and order of, of the detail. You know, So like a fixer might say, oh, well, I know this is third on the agenda, but that doesn't really matter right now because we started talking about this other thing. And the stabilizer is like, for the love of heaven, could we not just follow the agenda one time? I drafted it this way on purpose. <laughs> and the fixer hasn't looked at it. So no. they, they're they they're just like, yeah, okay, whatever, your agenda's nice. Uh, so uh, I think that one thing you could do when you're working with a fixer is if you have in your stabilizer, or an organizer probably, uh, if you have an agenda or a set of items that you want to cover, um, make sure they know about it in advance, which might mean walking in and sitting down with that person and saying, hey, can I have three minutes of your time? I want to go over this agenda. Or there are seven things that we need to talk about this week. Uh, tell me when you got some time in your calendar so we can sit down and talk about them. Uh, we fixers, well, I, I'll speak for myself, um, I guess, but as me as a fixer, uh, I live and die by my calendar because... I'm, I'm not. Otherwise, she can't organize herself. Yeah, I'm not great at ordering and organizing things. And so I have to have it in my calendar. So if someone comes to me and says, hey, can we blah, blah thing? I'm like, yep, here's my link to my calendar. So I think that's another important thing you can think about um, as a stabilizer or an organizer talking to a fixer. Get it in their calendar, and then they'll, they'll commit to whatever 
usually whatever you need. I would say so. Most professionals do anyway. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's good. If you think of anything else, well, we're like type us in some questions or um, some comments if you have them and that as we move through these. Um, I'm going to go to stabilizer. That is our biggest culture type. Um, 44% I think of all humans are stabilizers. So the thing about, so stabilizers are the people that are team driven and they're order tolerant. So those are, um, you're on the same side of that graph on page 26 and the same side as fixer. So you have one strong thing in common and that is your team driven. Uh, you like, stabilizers prefer social order. Um, they like to come in, they like to know who's on their team. They like to um, know their team. They like to know what's going on. They don't like surprises necessarily, uh, especially big ones. And so um, they are incredibly well-respected leaders um, because they tend to protect their people in a way that uh, I think probably resonates with the people. So let's say the executive team is always doing crazy stuff. They want to push the company forward. They're buying companies or they're rolling out new technology or whatever. And a lot of time those stabilizer leaders, I call the eye of the storm leader. So like there's all this chaos going on above their head and they're the ones that are protecting their people um, from all of that chaos. And frankly, a lot of the folks that are like getting the work done focused on um, whatever they're doing, those people like to feel that protection from the chaos. So um, the, that's really, those stabilizer leaders, um, that's kind of how they tend to lead. And so if you're a stabilizer, you love a stabilizer leader because that means that they're protecting you and you know, then you know that they're protecting you from all that chaotic nonsense going on. Um, if you have a stabilizer leader and you're a fixer, the thing that's going to drive you crazy is that they're they're going to feel like you're going to feel like your boss is very, you know, predictable. They are always um, writing reports or they want you to write reports. They don't want to hear your crazy ideas. They want to show you to show them step by step what's going to happen. They want to understand. They want you to, if you have a new idea, they don't want you to just come in and brainstorm with them. They want you to come in and show them that you've thought everything through, this is how it would work, these are the people they're gonna need, this is the types of people we're gonna need. So it's they're really gonna want much more structure than you want as a fixer or an independent. Uh, but the great thing is, is you both love team. So if you can uh, find a way to appeal to that team um, approach, I think that will be a, real, a strong common denominator. So even if you feel like they're far too organized for what you wanna be, um, you can at least say, hey, this is for the good of the people that we work with. Um, how can we work on this together? And then you're going to have to come toward them a little bit on the being organized. And then um, if you can, talk to them about, hey, you're a stabilizer. I'm a fixer. I'm going to be, you're, I'm going to feel chaotic to you. Um, how can how can I help, you know, sort of translate what I'm trying to say for you? I think that would be a really productive and interesting, frankly, an insightful conversation. Um, an independent and a stabilizer has literally nothing in common as far as work environment <laughs> preferences. preferences. Yeah. And so um, that's going to be, if you're an independent working for a stabilizer, that's really going to maybe drive you crazy because an independent loves the chaos and freedom, loves that problem solving, dynamic problem solving, kind of big idea um, disruption. They're, they're more inclined to disrupt than any of the other four types. And so you're gonna wanna like, if you're an independent working for a stabilizer, you're gonna feel like they are constraining you, like you can't get out. And because independent, I think we say in the book, loathes uh, structure and feeling um, constrained. So that's gonna be something that you're really gonna have to talk to those stabilizer leaders about because um, frankly, that's gonna really be an anathema to, oh, I'm going to mute my that's computer. Me. Oh, that's you? That's okay. my computer. Um, so I'm going to really, um, it's going to feel really constraining. And so you're going to really need to work with them on um, how that, how you can work within the stabilizer structure that they probably have in place um, without driving each other nuts. So, because you're going to, that's going to, and so maybe you ask for as an in, independent, you tend to be able to work independently or on your own more. You're more um, self-driven. So maybe the solution there is to look or seek or ask for 
uh, projects that where you can actually work on your own and then you can be a little more creative, a little more uh, chaotic in your day to day because you're not really affecting anyone else. And so maybe that's an opportunity for you to work with a stabilizer leader in that way. And then if you're an organizer working for a stabilizer leader, um, you both love order. So um, that's going to really give you a lot in common. So you're not going to have any of that tension around too much formality or too much structure. But what you might have is they might want you, the, structure, the stabilizer leader might want to pull you into the team because they're team people and you don't care about team. Not that you don't value team, you just would rather work on your own. And so, and we've actually had, I was having a conversation about that last week um, with a team, a reality team. And one of the people is an organizer and, but they keep trying to do like team retreats and team Friday afternoons and we're gonna hang out together and play games, you know? And the organizer is like, doesn't care, hates it, does not wanna be forced to go. And so that's the kind of tension that you'd probably have between uh, the organizer employee of a stabilizer leader. So yeah, anything else about stabilizer leaders that you can think of? I think your story about the, um, when you worked at the college. Oh yeah. You should tell that one. Tell that's that story. a great example. Yeah, so that's in the book. I, I, was, uh, I was hired to um, develop uh, to grow the STEM disciplines at a small university, the science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines. And because it was a traditionally liberal arts college, small teaching college. And so I hired me in to work with the president's team. And so do to do, I was there to be a fixer, uh, be creative, creative solutions, all that stuff. Well, so I went in, I thought we had a hospitality program and we have a chemistry program and uh, biology. And so I thought, what a cool idea is to create a wine chair. So um, get a get a um, alumni or a donor to fund a, a person who, who is an expert in wine. And then we could combine wine with, you know, the hospitality side, because frankly, if we're graduating kids with hospitality degrees, they should really understand wine and, and how wine works in hospitality. Um, and then also we could kind of blend in the science into it too. And I'd already worked with the, a local bar and they were willing to host because of course campus is dry campus and all that. So I was so excited about this. I ran into my uh, provost office and I said, oh my God, it's such a great idea. It's gonna be amazing. And they were just uh, horrified, not necessarily by the idea, but because wine is already kind of blowing their mind. I thought wine was pretty genius, but um, <laughs> I mean, it's wine. Let's be clear. We always think wine is a good idea. <laughs> but um, the trick was is that they didn't understand how we would go from having nothing to creating something out of nothing and have it be this amazing thing. Like he could not physically imagine it. And so um, he, it got killed immediately because I didn't have and, – and for me as a fixer, I'm like, I don't want to go do all the research and – do build the plans and everything if you're not going to like the idea because why waste my time right because fixers loathe wasting time nothing else and so um anyway so it, it ended up dying but it was a really good lesson for me that now the next time i would go in there i'd say okay i want i think this is a great idea and now i will uh we'll get the grant from here and that will allow us to do this and that will allow us to do that and then i want because otherwise it just uh was going to die right there so that's one um, one sort of example. Yeah. So keep in mind that if, uh, if you, uh, if you're a fixer or an independent and you feel like your boss is always like stamping on your ideas and squishing you. And, um, you know, if you walk back to your desk a lot of times thinking this gal just doesn't really care about what's important to me, assess that and think about what's important to them. And, and why is it important to them? And how can you communicate with them differently so that you can align the things that are important to you with the things that are important to them and then the team as a whole? Hmm. Yes, another, just as an example, we see stabilizer leaders a lot. A lot of people look at stabilizer and think, oh, well, they're not the people and that are leading teams. But actually we worked with a lot of organizations in a lot of different verticals that have stabilizer leaders. So it's definitely something that um, is, People are out there. They tend to be the experts, so they stay in their same field for a long time. And um, and so if you're having that tension with them, that's probably what's going on. 
And I want to just take a moment to stop and say, how brilliant is it that now the conversation doesn't have to be, you know, Rachel, it really hurts my feelings when you uh, are mean to me when I give you my ideas. Mm -hmm. So instead of that, it's, hey, Rachel, you're a stabilizer and I'm a fixer. And I just realized by reading this awesome book uh, and joining this Facebook group and taking this live certification class <clears throat> that uh, it has nothing to do with our personalities. It has everything to do with how we work. And so from now on, I'm going to do these three things to communicate better with you. And you could do these three things to communicate better with me. Uh, and this really isn't about us and our personalities at all. Uh, it really changes the scene in any communication you have, and even when you are going to communicate with your boss. Because <clears throat> who likes to go in and talk to their boss about not getting along with them? No one, because the boss is the, the authority figure. So that's effectively, when we transition out of a family unit into a job, there, we're tribal, so there's still an alpha person, and it's, you know, well, the psychology goes, there could be other, there are other alpha people in groups, but that's for a different episode. <laughs> that's anyway, a lot different call. <laughs> organizationally speaking, the authority is held by the boss, whoever that is. And so you don't want to challenge your boss because that, you know, in our brains, our, our reptilian brain is saying, well, that's like challenging your parent. And we were taught not to do that. So this isn't challenging the person. It's challenging the way you communicate the, the word and, and sh saying, listen, we just have wor different work preferences. So it really gives you an opportunity. It gives you a platform to have those conversations without it being awkward, which is brilliant, if I do say so myself. <laughs> well, it will still be probably awkward if you're not used to having transparent conversations, but it, it takes out the anxiety about, I, I can't, how can I have this conversation without saying he's an ass or without saying that he's not that he doesn't like me or I, you know, it takes out that whole thing. So yeah, I love that right. about it. Depersonalizes it, I would say. Yeah. Organizations, a lot of times will use policies and procedures for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. So like as a manager or if you're in HR or if you're in safety, if you're safety bound uh, industry, they have policies and pre procedures. So it's, you're not, you're not trying to be, you're not trying to argue with an employee. You're trying to say, listen, we have a policy that says this thing. And so policies, procedures can't be argued with. This is the same sort of concept in that it's logic. Um, and it, it, you know, logic can't necessarily be argued with. Now the, your supervisor might say, well, I don't believe in the stuff that you're, uh, or I don't care. Um, but again, that's for another conversation. Yeah. Okay, so on to the independent leader. I which, love these stories because they're fun. It's yeah, fun which might be the most uh, painful, really. The independent leader is probably the most painful for all of the other types. Um, Maybe. So the independent loves chaos and, and really chaos in that sense. You know, we joke a lot that if you're on the top half of the graph, you see chaos as freedom. They see it as freedom, but they actually really do like um, a little bit of chaos. So they're disruptive by nature. Um, and then they aren't so much worried about what the team is thinking or how the team might go about solving a problem or, or finishing a project. They're really driven more by what they think and what they're doing and how can they um, serve the objective and serve themselves. And that, those are not bad things. Remember, friendly reminder, none of the culture types are, no one's a superhero, no culture type is a superhero, no culture type is a villain. Uh, they're all good in their own right. And it's great to have all of them. And, and the reason we talk about all of them is so that we can all understand differences uh, more easily. So if, uh, if I'm a fixer working for an independent, so a fixer and independent both on the top half of the graph, kind of like that freedom and chaos, so that's not a problem. But the fixer is going to say, oh, watch my hand. It's like it was slow for a second. Was it skipping around? It was slow. Okay, sorry. I'm... Squirrel. Uh, a fixer is going to say, well, let's, you know, let, let, let's get the group together and let's all talk about this. And the independent is going to say, I don't think so. Now, the real challenge with that is that the independent's probably probably going to be the one um, who most often has the new crazy idea that the fixers gonna be like, yeah, let's do it. And then the independent leaders gonna be like, I don't know, you go talk to the group about it. I'm gonna be over here. And the fixers gonna be like, well, but wait, did you, 
your it was your idea and how are we gonna flush it out without you uh so yeah and then the independent's gonna say it is not my problem i'm going to lunch or <laughs> i'm going to start some crazy some new other idea. crazy new project so uh a fixer will have to deal with that independents are usually really strong-willed by nature so fixer will have to deal with that part of uh, of an independent um and i think the best way to approach that is to say if you do, if you can just expect it then it doesn't seem right. so hurting and shocking for, so for forewarned so you can just say all right john's going to come to me and he's going to have this brilliant new idea and then i'm going to start running with it of course you're going to absolutely say hey well you should join us in the meeting and then if they say oh i can't i got this other thing to do don't get butt hurt just say okay great we'll have the meeting i'll send you a summary of the notes and then you can let me know if you have any edits to make on that uh now this is if they're a leader if you're leading that person that might be a little bit of a different conversation they probably will have to join in and you want your leader to be part of the conversation when they need to be but it, as a fixer working for an independent it just might be about um you know, choose your battles. When do you really want that independent involved? When do they really need to be involved and in what? Um, and when can you update them with a summary? In person, they will not read it. Yeah, that's probably true. Or t text it to them. Text it. Maybe. If you want to text an entire summary, no. But no, no. they will read that. Bullets, bullet points. Bullet points, points. yeah. Um, okay, so if I'm a stabilizer working for an independent, just a minute. Hi, Terry. Hi, D. Terry, I got your culture type assessment. I'm going to send it to you. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. So if I'm a stabilizer working for an independent, um, pretty much opposite about most everything. <laughs> so stabilizers right. like a team environment, and they really like order. Uh, independents are individuals with chaos. So, hmm. If you're a stabilizer working for an independent, there are just some things you're going to have to say. Uh, these are these are things I'm going to have to be used to. Now, the real cool thing about being a stabilizer working for an independent is that you provide that independent in a business setting, especially you provide that independent with things that they really, really need that they won't do themselves. They need that agenda. They need someone to say, well, what about Joe, Susie and Jim? Because it's important that we know what everyone's doing. And here's our strategy for hitting the marks on all the things. And so the, the very thing as a stabilizer that you love in, in that order and working with the team and collaborating and strategizing and making sure everyone's together on it is the thing that that independent needs. And so uh, it's gratifying to have someone to say, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to do that. You go do it. And remember that they don't mean I don't want to do it. You do it because it's beneath me it's that they really actually don't like to do that kind of work I don't know how to do it. and so you have a real opportunity to shine in that organization or in that department because um you're the person who's going to do that stuff mm -hmm. uh and then if you're an organizer working for an independent you two can sit in separate offices alone <laughs> and work on separate things and everybody's okay with that or work on the same thing uh, and send messages to each other back and forth in Google Hangouts or Skype or whatever everybody uses um, and never have to walk around the corner into the other office. And that'd be fine with both of you. So that's nice, mm -hmm. uh, both on that self-driven side. Um, independence, though, like more of that chaos and freedom and uh, organizers really prefer order. And so when you're an organizer, you will want a lot of details uh, to understand what the project is. That independent leader is going to walk in and they're going to say, we're going to start an ice cream shop on the corner of fifth and main. See you later. And you're going to say, I sort of hate your guts right now because that is not enough information. So as an organizer, it's going to be really important that um, you, you make that independent sit down with you and flush out some ideas. Again, if you get on their calendar, that's an important thing. And also if you say, I need 10 minutes of your time, they, they think independents think in terms of seconds. And so if you say, I need 10 minutes of your time, or like if you block out on their schedule, whatever the smallest block you can possibly get your stuff done in, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, block it out that way because they really appreciate that you appreciate that their time, that time is going fast. Not that their time is important, but that time is going so fast, they don't have time to sit down 
for half an hour and visit before you spend a half an hour talking about stuff. Uh, another thing you can do as an organizer is find stabilizers that work uh, within your organization or your department and align with them because both of you are seeking. Uh oh, we're possibly stopped moving. <laughs> That's a great look, though. Uh, oh, maybe. The computer fell asleep? Nope. We're on the right we're on the right um, network. Um, we're getting the spinning wheel of death. Are we live or are we dead? Mm, I guess maybe you couldn't tell us. Let me get my phone off. I'm gonna roll too, man. All right, let me see if I go to the site. I'm gonna go on my phone if you can if this is actually live, but our screen's locked up. <laughs> I'm checking on the things. Okay, I don't see the live on here. Lecture live video. Okay. Oh, we're on. Let right, me see if I go to the site. I'm going to go oh, on my phone. Because... Still, still working. So oh, okay. our screen is locked. So I'm just going to pause it. Hold on. Lecture live video. Okay. Oh, okay, thank on. you, Bob. And we're just going to close. I just keep oh, keep doing it. Okay, got it. Okay. We're good. Okay. We can't see ourselves. That's probably fine. Okay, carry on. Okay. So, so if you're an organizer and you have an independent uh, leader, maybe find those stabilizers within the organization because you're both seeking out that same information for different reasons, but you both really would prefer to have the details so you can organize your thoughts around mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So if you go find those people, those other stabilizers and organizers within the organization and say, hey, let's get together and see if we can, uh, you know, have a meeting with the leader. Um, or if one person said, hey, man, I got on his calendar <laughs> and I got 10 minutes. So whatever information I get, I'll give you an upload. And that will really help uh, everybody feel a little bit better, especially those stabilizers, because they're really worried about uh, how everybody's impacted and how That's how everyone how everyone's role wraps up into the project or the organization generally. So um, align with the other folks in your organization that care about and think about and think in the same way that you do. Yeah, I love that too. Um, almost when we think about independent leaders in organizations, there's a lot of independent leaders we've met that are like sort of those solopreneurs. They just get to go do whatever the hell they want when they want to do it and whatever, right? But for people that we've seen in organizations, there's almost always a fixer pivot or, uh, for those really independent leaders. Like I think we talk about Elon Musk in the book where super independent guy clearly tells the shareholders to, you know, that they're asking dumb questions. Um, but if Look you, you didn't swear, I know so I didn't you. swear. <laughs> um, so the, the, he has a fixer that was, well, he has someone on his staff that was interviewed. It was a vice president. I forget her name, but it's in the book anyway, but she basically takes his crazy ideas and has to translate them into something that everyone else can actually do. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we see that uh, fixer, being the pivot between the super independent and then the people that actually have to figure out how to make all of those crazy ideas work. The challenge, of course, is that fixer we've seen really can burn out because um, the independence being still being uh, independent, stabilizers still being stabilizers, and that fixer is trying to figure out how to make all that work for everybody. So that's really a, a thing that we see a lot. Usually the right hand man or woman of um, the independent leader is really like a little bit fried. Yeah, if you know who that person is in your organization, buy them their favorite chocolate or a bottle of wine or get them a massage or something. Because one, they need they're it. Protecting they you. deserved it. <laughs> Two, they're protecting you. And three, pretty much if you need something, they'll <laughs> they can get it. So right. Uh, yeah, those people. I've been. I have been, that, have person been that person more than once. So I know. Uh, and I, if I can, if I can be so bold, Terry uh, has some experience with an independent leader um, that you know d is necessarily the rest of the team is sort of always grappling with, right? So Terry knows what we're talking about here. Yeah, um, I guess the audio is intermittent, but or sorry, the video is intermittent, but the audio is good, so we're just gonna keep 
pushing along here. So yeah, I guess our last one is an organizer leader. Mm -hmm. Organizer leader is, have we met an organizer leader for sure? Sonia. Oh, Sonia, that's right. Sonia. Organizer leaders. So um, organizer leaders are uh, really put together. They are completely like self-driven and totally organized. So they're the people like one of our leaders that we work with, Sonia, she's unbelievable. She's like doing shit all the, sorry, doing stuff all the time. And I, she's got to get like two hours of sleep a night. Like, I don't even know how she manages it because she's doing, she's on the board of some big new company. She works for a big organization as a project manager. She's the CEO of a non a national level nonprofit with teams all over the U S like it's crazy. The stuff that she does. So she's super organized and that's how she can get away with it and still be productive to all of those and honor all of those commitments. Um, so the tricky thing about an organizer leader is that they think that, well, like all of us, everyone's like them, right? So they think that we're all or super organized, that we're all self-driven, and that we should just be going off and doing what we need to do. Well, of course, we can all get work done. But over time, we want to feel like we're part of a team, that we are appreciated, that we're valued, that uh, we have an opportunity to learn and grow together as a group. And that's just by and large, the organizers are just there. They, they might understand that uh, in the abstract, but they don't need that. And so um, what happens a lot of times is the, the people that work with an organizer leader have to kind of remind, especially on the team side, to kind of remind that organizer leader that they all need the, the most of the rest of their people. Cause I think it's like 65 plus percent are team driven, right? Of humans. Yeah. So most people are um, team driven, which makes sense. And so um, a lot of times you either have to remind that person that they need, people need that, or perhaps what they need to do is um, just tell that organizer leader, Hey, I'm going to manage a potluck for the holidays. And then you just go do it. Um, so you have to um, help remind the organizer leader that people need each other. Um, in a, in a, especially in a high stress environment. Um, the more support, the better. Um, an independent uh, person working for, an independent type working for an organizer leader, you're gonna feel like they are way too constrained a lot of times, way too organized. You wanna be more totally disruptive. You wanna do something new and different. And uh, that's not gonna really resonate with an organizer leader. So you're really gonna have to work hard to try to organize your thoughts a little better for that organizer leader. Otherwise, um, they're just gonna kind of dismiss you as this crazy idea person that uh, doesn't have any, um, you know, um, credibility. credibility, organization, um, get it done this kind of person, that you're just this big idea, hand waver, but no substance. So that's gonna be your big challenge with an organizer leader. Yeah. What else? There, there was something else I thought about organizer leaders. Okay. Good. Um, Organizer leaders, what do you think? What else you got? Some notes over here. Oh, these are just notes for other times. We're always she's a fixer, always thinking about making things better, easier. Uh, I don't know. I think you actually said what I was thinking about, so that's good. Okay, great. Um, so our stuff's frozen on our screen. But I'm going to check the live in case anyone's asked any questions that are hot burning uh, questions for us here. Um, do, do, do. Right. Good. Let's Everyone's see. just telling so us the that we're there. Know. Yay. Thank you so much uh, so. for um, for keeping us up to date. We can't can't read you live on the screen, but uh, we're kept catching it. So it's about 2.45. Um, that's about when we like to sign off. Um, if you have any questions or concerns or you have a specific instance that maybe you don't want to ask in the group, but you'd like to um, ask us. Of course, we love to sit down and tackle those uh, with you or um, help you strategize about how to work in your group or um, if you have a specific need or interest. So, all right. Yeah. Anything else before we say goodbye? Uh, for the people that are um, joined late, um, thanks for being here. And um, we need Amazon reviews. So we're giving a free book or a free access to this community uh, for one of your colleagues, friends, or relatives, neighbors, whatever. Um, and that's a $100 value. 
Um, and then the free book is 16 bucks. So happy to send that to anyone you like uh, in exchange for an Amazon review because we really need those. So Yes. All right. So go do them even if you already have the book and you're already in the group. Please, for the love of heaven, <laughs> give us a review on Amazon. Five stars or four. Nothing below four. Well, you know, we have to allow them a little bit of autonomy, I guess. In their well, you get to review it however you want. Right, but you don't have to write words. You can just give us stars. Like, that's a pretty simple process. I'm certain that everyone who, I'm guilting, you know. I'm certain that everyone on here. She does this. Oh, I am not, I'm recovering Catholic. I know, but you were trained up in the guilt You know it. I'm sure that you're all smart enough to go on Amazon oh, and do a review. Oh, yeah, I'm certain. So I expect to see a review from everyone who's on here uh, by the end of the day. And Rachel says thank you. I say thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So lead powerfully. Change the world. See you next week. Bye, guys. I don't know if we'll be able to end it. <laughs> We, we might be on here forever, but um, thanks for being here. Love you. We're going to do some crazy stuff here. One second. Do, do, do. Can I'm you gonna end it from gonna, here? I don't think so. I'm just going to quit it. Of course, quit. <laughs> I know.